It's a very festive, very exciting occasion. My name is Lorraine Davies. I'm a sociologist and I'm one of Ingrid's best friends. <laughs> I'm trying not to get choked up. And uh, it's my uh, honor and my pleasure to welcome you here today to Ingrid's ultimate lecture and really a celebration of her life and her career uh, in sociology. So, uh, when we were talking to Ingrid about, you know, your ultimate lecture and, and what are you going to do and she said she would like Julie and I to introduce her, which we both thought was an incredible honor. So we're both going to say a few words. We've kind of split it up because we're very organized. <laughs> and uh, and well, we won't take too much time because I know you're actually here for Ingrid. But it really is a pleasure to introduce Ingrid. So um, as I said, Ingrid's one of my very best friends. And she has been a very influential career and life mentor. So Ingrid began, you may know or you may not know, that Ingrid began in the sociology department as a faculty member, as an assistant professor in 1981. And I think most of us here will agree that Ingrid has always been a voice of reason, wisdom, and no nonsense in the department. I know I speak for many when I say she's a valued and respected colleague. Since she began in 1981 and really for much of her time in the department, Ingrid was the senior female professor. So from the minute she started as a young woman. Because frankly, there were very few women that were hired at that time. And those who were hired tended not to stay. Thankfully, that reality is not true now. But I can imagine that she found um, being the main female role model and mentor somewhat of a solitary responsibility and it was clearly invisible work. But in true Ingrid fashion, she carved out a successful career and she created a network of colleagues and friends. She did this, as I've said, with wisdom and with kindness and with honesty and with grace. The sociology department is stronger and it's a better place because she's been a member. I benefit from her friendship and I have benefited from her mentorship. And so I'll just explain a little bit. Ingrid is a feminist. And I remember when I was about 23 or 24 years old being in her office and talking to her about somebody. And I referred to this person as a girl. And she listened in her quiet way. And then she paused <laughs> and she said, uh, Lori, because that's what I was at the time, she said, is the person you're talking to 14 years of age or younger? <laughs> and I'm, so I'm literally 23, right? And I looked at her really confused, and she explained to me, well, if the woman that you're referring to is not 14 years of age or younger, then she's actually a woman, not a girl. And that was a really simple statement. Um, but in that statement, my view of myself and my view of other women actually shifted and it elevated. And I cannot tell you the number of times I have quoted Ingrid. <laughs> I have used that same tone, which isn't shameful or blaming or accusatory, but just very gentle. I have repeated that short, gentle statement to my children, to my students, to partners, and to friends. And it's often led to much longer conversations about gender relations and what it means to be a feminist and what it means to believe in equity and to believe in equality. So what I say is, I would not describe Ingrid as an activist leader, and I would not describe her as an activist mentor, but I would say that she actively lives by her beliefs and her values, and Ingrid speaks her truth. And this is a very quietly powerful way of influencing, influencing and supporting others to be their very best. And I have definitely benefited from that. So Ingrid has modeled how to enjoy life and how to thrive in your career. And I put those side by side for a reason because they're both really important. And she's been able to do both. She's modeled how to have a family and how to find time to develop interests and hobbies. Craig her partner, and her children, Michael, Patrick, Kari, Kai, and Nora are and have always been front and central to her life and in her life. 
She has a really large, if you know her, you'll know she has a very large and often complicated <laughs> close extended family who she really values and who are our priority and are the, grand ch the grandchildren in whom she and Craig delight. When she was around 40, I remember her coming into the, um, into the mail room in the department before she's going on sabbatical and announcing, I'm going to take painting lessons. I have decided I'm going to learn to paint. And so I would have been, what, 29, right? And I remember thinking, seriously? Like, in addition to everything you do, you're actually going to become, a, you know, you're going to learn how to paint? And she's like, yes. And off she went to France. And just like that, she did. And in today, you have, I have many of Inger's beautiful paintings in my home. She exhibits them. She has her own studio. Um, you know, she, she does, she presents her work regularly in London and surrounding areas. And I love her paintings. And one of the reasons why I love her paintings is that when you look at her paintings, Ingrid is sharing with you the beauty that she sees in life, her sense of whimsy, and her feelings of happiness. So many of her paintings are of nature. There's a lot of really cool ones about crows. <laughs> There's some really beautiful ones with dogs that really speak to me. Or really interesting landscapes that you know she's come across. Or often some old homes where she has really found like a sense of meaning and history and family. And for Ingrid, um, for those of you probably who don't know, but many of you do know, being outdoors a lot of the time, getting out, is really a necessity and really important to her. So she paints outside as much as she can. She loves to hike and she loves to bike. And I can't really thank her enough because Ingrid introduced me to the joy of taking walks in the woods. And uh, as a result of, oh, probably at least a couple hundred walks that we've taken together, um, it's really, it's now part of the fabric of who I am and it's a necessity in my life and she's helped me discover really the joy that comes from appreciating nature and friendship. And really I can't thank you Ingrid enough for your friendship. Oh, here I go. <laughs> 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 for over 30 years, I think it's 30, but maybe it's not quite 30, Ingrid, Julie and I have had regular dinner dates uh, where we catch up on our lives and our kids. And it started as whenever it was one of our birthdays, so that would have been three times a year. And as the decades pass, it's, for whatever reason, maybe we have more time, although it doesn't feel like that. <laughs> it's more often. And, uh, and so we have, uh, we have all of these date, dinner dates where we catch up on our lives personally and professionally. Some have referred to us affectionately as a triumvirate, <laughs> although what we're a triumvirate of, I'm not quite sure, but it sounded kind of cool. Um, so it's really, uh, it's been a really meaningful, a meaningful friendship, friendship personally and professionally and I, I can't imagine what, wh who I would be today had I not met Ingrid back when I was 21 years old and so I'm really grateful for that. So thank you for the opportunity to say a few words of introduction and I have not covered everything. So um, Ingrid, in addition to all that I have described, Ingrid's created a very successful and influential career. She's a scholar in the sociology of family ties and aging. She has an international reputation. So it's my pleasure to turn to Julie McMullen, who would like to speak. Uh, thank you, thank you, Lorraine. There's a reason that I didn't do that part, and I wouldn't have, because I wouldn't have been able to keep the tears in. So, I get to talk about the um, the uh, the scholarship that Ingrid has uh, delighted us all with. So, um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here, and it's great to see so many familiar faces. And thank you, Ingrid, for asking us to talk of, to uh, talk um, about you, introduce you. <laughs> Um, as part of this very special occasion. There are moments in life that are uh, both at once uh, serendipitous and, and transformative. And that moment for me came in 1989 when I took Ingrid's Family Ties and Aging course. It was serendipitous because it was the only course that fit into my timetable. <laughs> I read the syllabus and I, I read the title and I thought, oh God, this sounds boring. <laughs> but really it was the only one that fit in, so I took that course 
And it was transformative because when I walked into that classroom, I met a profound sociologist with a sharp intellect who unleashed my sociological imagination. It was a brilliant course, and from that moment, Ingrid and I began working together uh, in various scholarly kinds of ways. So it's at this point when someone is talking about one's someone else's scholarship that you like to count up the number of papers <coughs> that they've written, the number of book chapters, the research grants that they've had, the awards that they've won. <coughs> Excuse me, and Ingrid has many of all of those things. But rather than counting the lines on one's CV, I think it's important to read the lines on Ingrid's to fully appreciate the depth and the breadth of her scholarship and how she has really worked to transform the field of aging family ties in the sociological realm. Before anyone was writing about childlessness and aging, Ingrid began writing about it. Before people were talking about sibling ties and aging, Ingrid began writing about siblings and aging. Lesbian and gay relationships were not in this realm much before Ingrid began talking about it. Talking about it at conferences, writing about it in many scholarly journal articles. But really the work that I think will be her legacy is the work that she has done on ambivalence and family ties. Sociological ambivalence, family ties, and the critical nature in which those are applied. She's taken a concept of ambivalence, she's, um, she's expanded it to be a structural level of ambivalence that includes all of the race and gender and class relations, and has really transformed the way that family and aging and sociology of aging folks think about, um, think about this scholarship. I had the great pleasure of working with Ingrid on one of those papers, on the first conceptual paper. It appeared in the Journal of Marriage and the Family, and we um, spent two years trying to get that paper published. We fought like cats and dogs every step of the way. <laughs> we were arguing all of the time about what should be in the paper, what shouldn't be in the paper. It was the most challenging and yet rewarding scholarly experience of my life. And so I thank you for that, Ingrid. Thank and you. I thank you for how you have transformed um, the scholarship in family ties and aging over the last number of decades. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, I like being up there with you. <laughs> <laughs> and I have nothing else to put up there. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, I can probably ditch some of my talk. I'll try and do it as I go. <laughs> many, many thanks, Lorraine and Julie, for your remarks today and for many years, many years now of professional and personal camaraderie. I am a lucky woman indeed to have had the chance to work with you as students, to have you return here as colleagues, and to have you become such important friends to me. I have learned a lot from you over the years, and I look forward to learning more. I don't know how I'm supposed to start and continue this in a professional way. When <laughs> after I've heard those remarks. <laughs> Uh, thank you all so very much for being here. A very, very welcome mix of family, amazing, uh, friends fr around the table, our colleagues, students, staff. Thank you so much all for all, to all of you for being here. I'm going to have to go to my remarks or I could take too long and get really tangential. So my I apologies for going with prepared remarks, but I really wanted to cover some ground, so to speak. As I prepared my remarks today, I had many moments when I reminded myself of my father, who, when teaching his children a, or a story, 
sorry, telling his children the story, or recalling earlier times, would pause to remember someone's name, or wonder aloud, hmm, I wonder what happened to so-and-so. <laughs> While these were people who mattered very much to him, as listeners, they didn't matter very much to us because we didn't know them. Like my father, I found myself remembering key people in my life at different stages, sometimes trying to recall or look up information about them. I wanted to make sure to include everyone. And then I recalled dad, and I recalled my childhood. His endearing desire to acknowledge those who were important to him along the way, and us not really caring. <laughs> I decided that there would have to be many who have made a valuable difference in my life and my career that I will not mention by name today, but I know who you are and I hope that you do too. So here we are, my ultimate lecture. As for ultimate, my qualifier would be, this is my ultimate lecture as a paid member of my department. <laughs> In the dictionary, ultimate is defined as, are you ready? Last, final, beyond which no other exists or is possible. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds a lot like Monty Python and the dead parrot, doesn't it? It also sounds a bit too ominous for me. Fortunately, ultimate is also defined as fundamental. And this is more in keeping with how I view my lecture today. Rather than focus on the specifics of my scholarly career, I'd like to take a broader look at some of my fundamental experiences in work and less so life. Hence my title, Reflections, Looking Back, Looking Ahead, Enjoying the Present. Compartmentalizing has characterized much of my life. Today my aim is to change course a bit and bring some compartments of my life together to reflect on the past throw out a few ideas about the future, and end with the here and now. I love being a university professor, and I love being a sociologist. For me, it has been a near perfect fit. The chance to think and write about interesting ideas, the pleasure of being in the company of succeeding cohorts of students, and discovering the timelessness of their life stage, as well as the uniqueness of particular times, the opportunity to meet people around the world, and the good fortune to be in a demanding and rewarding, but comparatively flexible situation, work situation. I make all of my following comments in this context. It has been a great run, and while I look forward to working less and paying more attention to other things, the looking ahead part, I don't plan to stop altogether. But first, let's look back. Exactly one month ago, today, I turned 68. Exactly 50 years and one month ago, I turned 18. <laughs> and that summer, the summer of 69, my parents drove me to London from Kingston to meet with an academic counselor, a physics professor, about my course selections as a student in social science. Go figure. <laughs> it was some of the worst advice I ever received. <laughs> Unfortunately, I followed it, and to this day, I have no idea why. But maybe it proved to be a good lesson. That September, my parents took the same drive down the 401 to deliver me and a friend to residence, Saugeen Maitland Hall, the year that it opened and was christened the zoo. In those days, the women were in the lower Maitland Tower and the men in the higher Saugeen Tower. We shared the elevators, cafeteria and common room, and when put to a vote, we women decided that we did not want to extend the restricted hours for men. Things have changed. Mm -hmm. Do all of you know where that residence is? Mm -hmm. On across Western Road, right? So I've often quipped um, that in 50 years, I have only managed to cross the street. <laughs> but in fact, there have been many geographic and metaphorical journeys since then. My career pathway was not unlike that of many of my younger colleagues, which at this point is pretty much all of my colleagues, but I probably made family commitments a little sooner. My graduate work and early teaching focused on deviance and criminology. I finished my doctoral coursework in comprehensives at the University of Toronto in 1975 at the age of 24. I then turned to my thesis, ditching my first topic when it became clear that I wasn't going to get the data I wanted 
to be able to test my ideas about the criminal justice system. And against usual practice and advice, I wrote a theoretical thesis instead. In 1976, I married Craig and became mother to our older sons, Michael and Patrick. I'm very happy to say that they are here today. I defended my thesis in early 78. The late 70s and early 80s were not a great time to be on the academic job market. There weren't many jobs, and like many professional women with a partner who was already employed, I was trying to find work in a reasonably close proximity to my spouse and family. While completing my thesis, I took a one-year appointment at Waterloo, commuting daily from London. The next year, I took a one-year visiting appointment at U of T and honed my skills at compartmentalizing, working with tunnel vision during my days in Toronto so that I could focus more on my family when I was at home. In the 70s and 80s, the area of deviance provided a large umbrella for studying topics that generally were not recognized <laughs> in their own right, but are now. Now they are the focus of courses, departments, and centers, including gender studies, LGBT or queer studies, aging, and disability. During my year at U of T and later at Western, I covered these topics in my full year course on deviance. They all provided excellent examples of the sociological understanding that deviance is socially defined and being deviant does not mean being bad or being part of a minority. As a regular newspaper reader, then and now, I paid attention to materials relevant to my teaching. In 1978, two public opinion polls reported in the Weekend Magazine, which was a supplement to papers across the country at that time, drew my attention. They were Canadians' views on the ideal age of retirement and Canadian views on dying. Curious about the research behind these reports, I ordered the complete survey results and my critical examination of them was eventually published in the Canadian Journal of Sociology. This became an example of serendipity. We both like that term. Serendipity in my life. One of my doctoral supervisors at U of T, Jim Giffen, knew that I covered aging in my deviance course, that I was studying opinion polls on retirement and dying, and that like many in my cohort, I was looking for work. He also knew that for the first time ever, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada was about to launch a funding program on a specific topic deemed to be of, in, of the national interest, and the topic, aging. He encouraged me to apply for a postdoc designed to encourage more Canadians to study aging. I ignored conventional wisdom, applied for that postdoc, was lucky to get it, and then burned my bridges as a specialist in deviance and criminal justice as I began studying aging. I've been at it ever since, and my foundation in deviance, such a conceptually rich area with inequality and social stigma at its core, has served me very well. During my postdoc here at the Healthcare Research Unit, directed then by Jay Turner, I launched one of the first three Canadian surveys on aging using a stratified random sample of 400 Lon Londoners aged 65 and over. I still remember the faces and comments of many of my subjects and their openness about their lives. The ups and downs of growing older, women's accounts of having to leave work when they married, retirees recalling the introduction of the Canada Pension Plan, losses during the Depression and World War II. I also remember their interjections. Do you have any children? And of course, I had Michael and Patrick. How old are they? I don't envy you having to raise children. It is so much harder now than it was in my day. Mm -hmm. Very much my sentiments about what it's like for my children to be raising their grandchildren today. Mm -hmm. I mean, my grandchildren, their children. <laughs> and yet both generations are turning out very well. That first study involved structured interviews with some open-ended questions for all participants and then follow-up conversational interviews with 40 of them. That is how I learned qualitative methods. About a year and a half into my postdoc, I applied for the uh, position in here, and that was in 1981, and that eventually became a tenure stream assistant professor position, but it was a limited term one when I started. From my early days, I have a sense of how it feels to have precarious work, to be job searching when the market and your circumstances limit your options, and the incredible value of having support behind you when you are going through this process. In 1984, I received tenure and promotion to associate professor, and in 1993, 26 years ago, 
I was promoted to full professor. Over the years, I continued research related to aging, focusing more and more on the negotiation of family ties across the life course. I think you know already now what I did because Julie told you so well, so <laughs> I'll just keep going. But I will say, during that time, we had, I was lucky to have a number of research grants and to be part of a very large study headed by Julie. I highly respect the value of what we learned through the data collected in these various studies. I also firmly believe that a good idea is worth a lot of data. The response to my conceptual work on ambivalence in family ties, um, Julie was very uh, humble about her engagement in that initial project, but she was actually the one who came to me to talk about doing it. Um, the response to that work, which was begun then and I've continued working on since, has probably been, as Julie's identified, the most gratifying part of my research career because it reflects the power of a concept to shine new light on subject matter and data that resonates with actual experience. Applying ambivalence at the levels of relationships, institutions, and structured social relations is truer to the complexity of family ties. It acknowledges that families serve some better than others and some not at all, and that even when good, family relationships are marked by contradictions, conflicts, and challenges. A vast body of research, that I'm sure a number of you know, shows that we are capable of remarkable resilience. But the risk when we focus too much on resilience is failing to deal with how unevenly the need to be resilient is distributed. Ambivalence focuses our attention on family life as an arena in which we confront and negotiate the contradictions and inequalities of the larger social world underscoring the need for social change to address issues that are often, too often treated as individual problems. As you've heard, in the early 80s, there were not many women in our department, and there, so there were few women to learn from. In my own family, I had two remarkable women precede me. My Norwegian grandmother, born in 1901, was a teacher and mother, and was jailed for six weeks during the German occupation for teaching her students about Norway. My mother, born in 1928, left Norway to study English in London, England, met and married my Greek-English father, immigrated to Canada with me in tow, returned to school after having her fourth child, and eventually had a PhD in economics along with three more children. You can see why I may not shine in my family. <laughs> it's a tough act of all. <laughs> like them, I was still in an era when women felt that they had to prove their professional worth by following the male model as much as possible. I've had some very supportive male colleagues. Bill Avison throughout my career until he retired a few years ago, Carl Grindstaff, Jim Teven, who learned a lot from his working wife, Bonnie, <laughs> and Valakrishnan, among others. These come to mind uh, in particular. But as a vastly outnumbered woman, it was hard to escape feeling on guard and feeling the need to find ways to be taken seriously. The cost of constantly working at being taken seriously is that you end up acting and seeming like a very serious, humorless person. I'm not sure that this talk is going to be very good at altering that impression. <laughs> <laughs> As I've grown older and my colleagues younger, I've had the pleasure of feeling much freer to be myself at work. In the early days, compartmentalizing my life was in part a response to the pressure I felt to be taken seriously and to represent women well. Like other women of my cohort, I was inclined to, I was inclined to speak relatively little, relatively little about my family life in order to encourage others to see me as a committed professional. But in parallel with my academic life was my daily life with my family. Initially, Craig engaged in his own multifaceted career. He covered a lot of bases in one location. And our sons, Michael and Patrick, as they moved from childhood to adolescence to adulthood. And then I started having babies. There's nothing like being visibly pregnant to declare the family side of your life. <laughs> and at my height, it was definitely visible when I was pregnant with my first baby in 1984. At that time, there was no official policy on maternity leave. Although we passed like ships in the night at Western, I was fortunate to have my dear friend, Frances Wesley, pave the way as the first woman in our department to have a child while in office. Even though the conditions were far from optimal, she made it seem possible. 
I was offered an eight-week maternity leave to be taken after the baby was born. As some of you know, that was Kari, my very special little daughter with Down syndrome, who died after heart surgery the following year. Our son Kai was born in November 1986 and is now working and living in LA and very much with us in spirit. Our daughter Nora, who is here today, I'm very happy to say, was born in January 1990. Maternity leaves had improved somewhat by the time that Nora was born, but were nothing like today's parental leaves, a much needed improvement. As you can probably calculate, I am both a relatively young and a relatively old mother, stuck socially off time for all of my children. At the time, one of my colleagues said he wasn't sure if he could handle having children who were dating and in diapers at the same time. <laughs> I thought it was great. <laughs> I am from a large family and eventually had a relatively large one myself and have greatly enjoyed the richness of family life. One result of compartmentalizing my life is that my family has always known much more about my work and how I feel about it than most of my colleagues have known about my family and how I feel about them. Yet an irony of working in the same place over many years is that people you who are not necessarily really close to you end up sharing some of your key events in life. A tight job market doesn't just make it hard to get your first job, it also makes it hard to move around. Many in my cohort and since have spent most of their career at the same place. In search of stimulation, variety, and colleagues who were women, I found conferences and sabbatical leaves fantastic opportunities. Participating at conferences in multiple disciplines, sociology, gerontology, and family, has made me part of a much larger academic community where I have met and become close colleagues and friends with other academic women of various ages who are links to the past, present, and future. Sabbaticals gave me opportunities for combining work and family as I finished bigger projects like writing a book or preparing a new study. The chance to live in other countries and to be exposed to alternative ways of doing things professionally and personally was challenging and reward rewarding for all of our family as we navigated different languages. We're talking about two different countries, two different ages of children. Um, navigated different languages, school systems, and living arrangements. I also found ways to spend time at other universities, including a term at Oregon State University and another one at St. Thomas University. I encourage you to look for opportunities like that. Research and teaching connections in England, Norway, and Swiss Switzerland also enriched that side of my career life. <clears throat> Over the years, I have to be careful about how I'm wording this, over the years, with one exception, and by this I mean there was one man, not that there was a woman who didn't do it, <laughs> our department has run well through the efforts of women. I speak, of course, of our administrative staff, the powerhouse behind our department, the one that's kept it going year after year, decade after decade. I've so enjoyed the presence of women as uh, the staff members who really kept our department moving when many of us were messing things up. So, and I also enjoyed the company of women taking on such important positions in the department. I also took heart from periodically attending women's caucus meetings and knowing that scattered across campus were some terrific and accomplished women, mostly retired now. Carol Lagosh, Connie Backhouse, Helene Berman, who is joining me in retirement, but we're on a similar path. Um, Kathleen O'Kulik, Madeline Lennon come to mind, and there were others. Not to mention a growing number of women in high places. When Emma Kazathmy became our first, I think so far only, uh, woman as dean, um, and of course now Lorraine and Julie. I've learned and continue to learn from younger women and their experiences. My daughter, my friends, my colleagues, and my sisters, and also from younger men my sons, male friends and colleagues, and my brothers. I've learned as well from women older than myself than I've that I've never met before. I've always liked a notion of having women ahead of me that I can learn from. One of them for me, and this is, I'm talking about admiring someone from afar, I never met her. One of them for me was Canadian journalist and social activist, June Callwood. On my office door is a picture of her with the byline 
This is what it's all about. It's kindness. In the article, she continues, if people can behave well to each other, that's all there is. With this many years in the same department, I've seen peaks and valleys. The disappointing times in my career have been when people did not behave well to each other. For me, bearing witness to such encounters has been a bigger part of this experience than feeling personally targeted, but either way, it diminishes our work environment for everyone. I am not a superstar teacher, but I have aimed to behave well toward my students, to respect them, to take responsibility for teaching them the important lessons of sociology, to hold them to high standards, and to appreciate that their backgrounds, their aims, and their, are, their abilities vary greatly. During the busy years of securing tenure, there was sometimes the sense, I'm sure you all know it if you've been trying to make your way through the ranks or have already done so, there was sometimes the sense that teaching was in the way of what would matter most, publications. I have loved the scholarly side of my work, the research, thinking, writing, conference talks, and publishing. But I do believe that through our teaching, we perform a very valuable public service. Most of our undergrad students are, will not become sociologists, but my hope has always been that exposure to sociology would influence their approach to their future work and personal lives. In my view, we must meet the challenge of making our research and writing a parallel contribution to the public good, not just a rewarding intellectual pursuit, a topic which leads me to thinking ahead, or looking ahead, sorry. I started university almost 50 years ago. Over that time, the route to becoming a tenured professor has remained startlingly static. Get a PhD, get a job, publish your work in academic journals, get teach decent teaching evaluations, do a reasonable amount of administrative work. The main thing that has changed as far as I can tell is that as it has become more competitive, you must publish more before you can get your first job. It doesn't matter as much as it used to whether you publish a book, and you have to provide a whole lot more inf documentation about teaching and administrative work when you go out for tenure and promotion. Unless you move, oh sorry, these are changes in degree rather than in substance. Unless you move into administration, the job description stays pretty much the same for your entire career. 40% teaching, 40% research, 20% community service, and then you retire. What does that say about innovation in universities? In my experience, the university sector, so counter to what one should be able to expect, is discouragingly slow, discouragingly slow to change. We hang on to old ways and make change reluctantly, often because it is forced upon us through legislation or the law, or for some disciplines, not sociology unfortunately, to remain competitive with the private sector, or when there is eventual caving to internal demands for change. Consider our record for maternity and then parental leave, for inclusion, including people with disabilities, for valuing older workers. More than ever, we are teaching a generation who will need to be flexible and innovative as they build their individual careers. Very few will start and end in the same career, let alone with the same employer. Yet many of us spend most of our careers in the same place rather than gaining the flexibility and experience of being in different work environments with different cultures and colleagues. As departments, it often means entrenched patterns that are not challenged by having more people join in. In conversations with more than one dean, I have suggested an exchange program for faculty so that faculty members could be exposed to alternative approaches at other universities while sharing their own work with a new set of colleagues, and bring some fresh ideas back to their home department, benefiting both faculty members and their departments. As for retirement, being a successful administrator, especially in tight budgetary times, still includes persuading people to retire, not in finding ways to alter work and pay arrangements that value accumulated strength and experience. Instead of continuing with the traditional all or nothing approach to retirement, why not offer faculty members who are still performing well but would like to work less an, appoint an appointment with lower pay and workload for the balance of their career? The freed up funds could be used for hiring others. Similar arrangements could apply at other life stages. For example, a multi-year contract with reduced load at reduced pay that supports better work-life balance for parents with children at home. 
Research and writing are core to my passion about being a professor, but I am frustrated by the way that we write. Often so stodgy and jargon laden, and the places that we publish, mostly academic journals that are read by so few. Yet we write about topics that are mostly by their very nature of great interest to very many people. What is the point? I reached many more people when I wrote a letter to a CBC radio program about our daughter Kari after she died than I have with most of my publications. That letter was read on air and later published in a book called The, Morning, the New Morningside Papers, edited by Peter Zosky, one of my favorites. I'm a big CBC fan. My letter was also used in writing courses, reaching an entirely different audience that way. Although a message from the heart about how much a child with special needs can mean to a family, rather than a sociological treatise, that letter addressed the value of social inclusion and family support, broached significant social policy issues, and apparently gave hope to new parents of a child with Down syndrome. I also believe that we are too, this is the part where it's really hard to see me as a humorous person, but I, I, I really want to think ahead in <laughs> large part on your behalf. I also believe that we are too inclined to end our written work with a call for more research, more knowledge, more education. That is our, our business, right? Yet there are many areas where we are ready to take action. We know what the problems are, we know what needs to be fixed, and we often have a good idea about the change we need to make. I think that recent and current cohorts of students and younger faculty members are ready to engage and ready to act to make things better. And I think the university community has a responsibility to help them find ways to channel that energy into employment, into action, into better social be policy, and into a better world. Rewarding alternative forms of communication, along with efforts to apply what we know, could be an important part of that effort. Speaking directly to sociology colleagues, I urge you not to become too narrow as a department. A marvelous thing about sociology is its breadth. Allow for the cross-pollination that occurs when everyone isn't doing the same thing. Expose students to the discipline's multiple facets. Encourage diversity in the faculty and in the students you attract by avoiding a focus on specialties that tend to appeal to selective groups. I believe strongly in the capacity to empathize with and relate to those in different circumstances. If I didn't, I would lose hope for the prospects of positive change. But I also believe in the strength that comes from not feeling alone, from having support from those who share similar circumstances, as well as from getting to know those who are not like you. Over my years in sociology at Western, I believe that we've changed for the better by hiring good people, women and men, with different points of view and different training. We've done especially well in hiring more women and more people who are openly lesbian and gay. Yet, if we take as a minimal guide the students that we teach, we clearly have other ways in which we must strive to be more diverse. Our faculty has also improved through initiatives that foster collaborative work across disciplines and that welcome students to feel like this building is their home too by offering them work and social space. I've been heartened by the greater comfort a broader range of students apparently feel to be who they are publicly. It has also been gratifying to see more diversity in leadership positions in the university. I am very happy to be retiring with the first woman to serve as chair of our department at the helm. Many thanks to you, Tracy, for the support that you have offered me and others and for bringing calm and quiet and confidence to the department when it was needed. And now to enjoying the present. I will end where I began. It has been a great run. I have loved being a professor and sociologist and I might add a woman. Do you know that older women are the happiest demographic in the Western world? <laughs> As some of you, most of all my family, know, it was hard for me to decide to retire, which is probably a good sign. It means that I am still enjoying what I do. I have appreciated the chance to mark my transition to retirement by giving this talk. It made me realize that much of the joy of my career has come from being in my office or at home writing, usually on my own, but sometimes with others, being in the classroom and working with my students, though not necessarily grading and lecture preparation, working with colleagues 
and being in the field doing interviews and being in the larger world of an academic at conferences, during sabbaticals, giving talks, and spending time at other universities. My experience of departmental life has been a little uneven, and there were definitely times when it could have been more fun. I find this a particularly good time to be in the department. The greater mix of ages and the better gender balance create a more welcoming work environment. Indeed, one of the things that made it harder to retire right now is that it seems to me that our workplace is becoming less about competing with and impressing one another and more about sharing ideas and forging good working relationships. To all of my colleagues, I encourage you to be kind, to behave well toward another, well toward one another as part of making this a place that respects and honors others and makes it fun to be here. To my more recent colleagues, I think that you are taking good steps in that direction, meeting regularly for lunch, sharing news, and encouraging one another. I am lucky to have spent most of my academic life studying and teaching aging, an area that contains many key life lessons. I would like to close by considering three of them. One, the value of living life fully and avoiding regret about the things you didn't do. Two, the value of developing and pursuing interests outside of work. And three, the value of close ties with friends and family. Of course, I'm still learning these lessons, but they have traveled with me since the early days of interviewing old people. And I hope that I will practice them more in the coming years. As to the first lesson about living life fully, there are stretches when I've done a little too well on that one. <laughs> so I aim to slow down a bit. But I have to admit that since deciding to retire, <laughs> I have continued to live the career side of my life at a fuller tilt than I had planned. <laughs> I really wanted to consolidate my career, and that, was, that has been my focus over the last two years. My way of doing this was to savor teaching my last class, a combination of nostalgia about it being the last time I would be teaching my students, but also mixed with a relief that I had finished setting my tests and making the deadlines for printing and that I had no more grading in my future. <laughs> I finished the third edition of Family Ties and Aging, a demanding enterprise that also brought together my research and writing. And I completed some writing commitments for journals and presented a keynote address in Finland last June. I've also been working on being more thoughtful about which work to say yes to. I can be braver and freer now and can choose work for its worth and pleasure. So far for me, that has meant saying no to writing a handbook chapter, and yes to giving a keynote address this October in Czech Republic, yes to writing a scholarly book review of Elizabeth Hayes' memoir, All Things Consoled, a daughter's memoir, almost done, and yes to submitting an article on a, to a family journal for a special issue on aging. These are things that mean something to me. I am thankful to have a three-year adjunct research professor position to ease the transition to retirement and with luck help me learn to live the work side of my life a little less fully. I think I've done pretty well on lesson two, <coughs> pursue an interest outside work, especially when I took a six-day painting class with my friend Francis <laughs> during a sabbatical in southern France of 1995 that Lorraine told you about. The object of that general lesson is to have interests that carry into old age. My experience of the lesson is that painting has also provided a wonderful complement to my work, a totally absorbing activity that opens a different part of me and yet has parallels to writing. Through painting, I have met a supportive community of artists with different backgrounds and united in a shared interest. Which brings me to the third lesson the value of close ties with friends and family. I have terrific friends from across a lifetime, from different spheres of my life, and all deeply meaningful to me. Both my work and my painting have fed the close ties with friends lesson. In three weeks, I will be participating in the London Artist 26 studio tour. I happen to have some brochures in my office <laughs> and would love to see you that weekend. And in June, I will be going to Toronto Island to paint for a week with a group of 16 artists, including my dear friend, Donna Andrzejczyk, and my studio mates and friends, Myra Burke and Catherine Eckstedt. My friend Beth from grade one will be joining us there. Next month, I will be heading to Niagara-on-the-Lake for an annual rendezvous, perhaps our 10th, uh, none of us can remember, 
I think it's around 10, with three great friends, Anne Martin Matthews from Vancouver, Carolyn Rosenthal from Hamilton, and Sarah Matthews from Ohio, all bright, accomplished, and entertaining women that I first met at a conference and who have been welcome ballast ever since. For sure, we will talk about today. Because Craig has been retired for some time now, I've had a preview of, of the opportunity that retirement provides for making new close friends, like Craig and Kathleen Brown, and for spending more time with old ones, a number of you here. I have said before that my family life is an embarrassment of riches. Until the age of 64, I still had both of my parents, and my mother continues to live on her own at the age of 91. I have six diverse and caring siblings, and complicated. I'm an especially fortunate woman to have a husband who is a true partner, to have incredible children and wonderful grandchildren. Throughout my career, I have had my family, Craig and our children, Michael, Patrick, Kai, and Nora, and little Kari too, with me and behind me, providing perspective on what really matters, stimulation through their interests and accomplishments, and loving support when things are tough and when they are terrific and during the more usual in between. They are the world to me. I've learned so much from the men as well as the women in my life about being caring and supportive. I have so enjoyed seeing better ways unfold in the lives of my sons and my daughter. Through my family, I have had personal exposure to just about every family situation that I have written about in Family Ties and Aging. <laughs> As much as my career has been a very important and rewarding part of my life, my most fundamental joys and sorrows, but mostly joys, have come from my relationships with my family and with my friends. I am enjoying where life has so far brought me, and I look forward to getting to know my current colleagues better as I pursue work more selectively, and to more walks and movies and dinners and painting and cycling and adventures and travels with my family and friends. From my current vantage point, I can only wonder what it was like for the participants in my first study to have a 30-year-old woman enter their home posing as an expert on aging. <laughs> they were generous with me, and I feel ready to continue exploring my own old age armed with the lessons that I first started to learn from them. I hope some of that exploration will involve making change. I know that it will involve many of you. Thank you so much for being here, for hearing me out, and for being part of a wonderful career.